Jane Bond, and people think that you're playing that's not really your name, and it is. Oh no, that's my birth name. No, that's my name. Yeah. And it's not my married name. That name belongs to me. <laughs> right. Yeah. And my family. Yeah. Right. So we've got Jane Bond. I'm happy to have her on here. And we actually uh, started communicating because of a post that I put up um, concerning um, high level racism, basically. So um, exactly. institutional racism at high levels. Um, the you know kind that a lot of people never really well they probably do get it but not this in the same way um, because it's it's uh, when you become a threat type of racism which is very unique in itself. Um, so this is so true, David. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this it's so true. it's actually in my opinion it's actually one of the worst forms um, because it's not like it's it's not it's no longer and it's no longer because you didn't do enough, or why don't you just pull yourself up by your bootstraps? It's literally you pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and them saying, give me them damn boots. And so we started talking about that and, um, you know, just kind of, I appreciated the comment and we just kind of went from there and just started chatting. I said, you know what, you gotta come on here and, and talk <laughs> to you. And here I am. But you know that <laughs> comment you made about pulling yourself, you know, up by your bootstraps, we all have to do that no matter what. Mm -hmm. you know, when, when the shit is deep, we have to put on our boots and we have to pull them up no matter what. But when you have people that are trying to stop you, then there's a fight. Because right. you're not going to get my boots. They're going to stay on and they're going to be pulled up as high and tight as I can get them so I can <laughs> go out there and do what I have to do. And, you know, that comes along with experience. Mm -hmm. You know, believing in yourself and being confident, you know, and, and being somewhat of a triple threat to people, mm -hmm. you know, and I always say that I'm a triple threat. Hey, I'm black, I'm attractive, and I'm smart, and I know how to work, mm -hmm. and I know how to put things on paper and make them come up off the paper and come alive, and that's no, all I know no. how to do. I've never worked for anybody, so mm. I don't know any other way to go out here and fight. Right. Yeah. It's very simple. And it was actually more than triple. That was five. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually so that's a quintuplet threat. Uh, oh well, and I'm almost six feet tall, so I don't know. I, I I'm Jane Bond totally. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So man, we have to get so give us obviously you are uh a high flying real estate broker. Um but give us some background. How did, how did all this start? And you never worked for anybody? I really have to hear this. I think that's amazing. Yeah. Um, I had one job. I, had, I was a flight attendant, you know, and to me that I didn't have a boss because I was up in the air. Right. You you're know, free. We had a ball. I mean, it was all about the destination and camaraderie and being with, you know, your, your colleagues, having a great time and knowing that you can go anywhere you wanted in the world, even when you were on your days off. And I only worked, you know, after I you know, gained seniority, I only worked 15 days out of the month. And most of the time I would go to Europe. It was a lot of girls, the girls that I knew, they were all going to LA, Chicago, you know, and I was like, well, you know what, if anything ever happens with this job, I need to think about going somewhere else first because I might not be able to go to those places. So I went the route of going to Europe and, and Japan and places like that, you know, Australia and Auckland, New Zealand. I wanted to see places that I thought I might not ever have an opportunity to see if I didn't keep this job for some odd reason or they didn't keep me. Mm -hmm. So that I took that route and that's what I did. Um, and fast forward four years into the job, I thought, my God, you know, I didn't go to school to, to be up here just serving people. You know, not that I didn't enjoy it, not that I didn't have a good paycheck. Mm -hmm. But I was just, you know, my dreams were just a little bit bigger. You know, I came out of school with a finance degree and boom, I went to flying. And that was okay because it was a lot of fun. I was a young girl and, you know, my dad was like, you know, let her go. Let her go because she might not be able to see the world one day. So that was really cool. But my mom was totally against it. She was scared to death. Every day, every time I would come home from Paris or London, she was like, did they fire you yet? Did they fire you yet? I know you did something <laughs> wrong. And I, it, she had a right to be afraid because at that time there was a lot of hijacking going on. And I hope I'm not dating myself too much. <laughs> and there was a lot of, um, you know, planes crashing and, and just 
complete terrorism going on. So that exposed me to the world. And that's where I built up my confidence level because I was engaging with people from all over the world, all walks of life. And most of the time I was in first class serving. So um, that was a very interesting time in my life. Fast forward, you know, when I decided I wanted to sit in that first class seat and be served as opposed to serving, I had to figure out something. So I decided I wanted to become an interior designer. And that's what I did. And from there, I started working with uh, professional athletes, football players, basketball players, lawyers, doctors, and so forth. And that was because I decided to go on chartered flights. That was my end. Since Mm. I was already flying, I didn't want to leave my job. I had to figure out another way. So I said, why don't I step back from the international and take the chartered flights, and then I'll be able to meet these football players. In turn, I did. I met Jackie Walker, from, Jackie Walker from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers who gave me my first shot. And I never advertised and the ball just kept rolling. Wow. And that was great. You know, I had people like Andre Waters, um, Broderick Thompson from the Chicago, uh, I'm sorry, from the San Diego Chargers and Harry Swain. Uh, oh my God. Uh, so many, I can't even think of their names now. Uh, who was it? Uh, Keith Byers, you know, from the Eagles. So that went on and on, and it was a great thing. And I garnered a 10-page spread out of Home and Design magazine, which was kind of my hit record, so to speak. And one day I was asked by one of my clients, would I help them with their managing of their career as far as singing was concerned? And I said, I don't know anything about that. I can't be a manager. And they were like, well, Jane, you know, it's all the same shit, business. And I was like, well, you're right. And she was like, you have the position, you have, you know, the attitude, the demeanor, you can go out there and really, you know, kick some ass. That's what she told me. And I was like, you know what, I'll give it a shot. And I did. And from that, I went into um, entertainment management and um, loved it. Absolutely loved it. Uh, Worked with the brand new heavies. I was their manager, worked with Nigel Barker from America's Next Top Model. And that went on. And then the world crashed. That was 2007, 2008, all of a sudden, boom. I was like, you know what? I'm up in New York City. I don't know what's about to happen. I got this apartment. I got this house. I don't want to lose either. I had to figure this out. So, you know, I decided I had to go. (laughs) And um, I got married. (laughs) So that's what happened. And I came down to Naples, Florida. um, And I wasn't sure what I was going to do, to be honest with you, because uh, I had no idea what was down here, what was going on. I didn't know anything about gated communities. I didn't know anything about golf. I didn't golf. I was a city girl. You know, I traveled the world. I wasn't golfing. I was too young to golf. At the time, I wasn't playing tennis. And, you know, I was like, holy crap, what am I going to do? And the game was real estate. And that was like 2008, 2009. And I was, I thought, well, the market is crashing. If what goes down must come up. Right. So now I'm going to get in. And that's exactly what I did. So I never really worked for anybody. It was always my own business. I mean, in bond management was my management company, you know, uh, Jane Bond Interiors. That was mine, TBJ. All of that. I created all of those and they just kept rolling. And it's a culmination of all the careers that I created for myself to where I am now. And I think that's why I'm able to handle that, this type of client or clientele, but it wasn't always that way. Yeah. So did you invest after the market crashed or you started brokering deals after the, after the crash or did you do both? Well, I was in real estate for a stint in New York city and when I, was in, when I was doing entertainment, I had the great idea of flipping. So I went back to Philadelphia in the hood where I grew up and I found a couple homes and I flipped them and I made great money. And right at the end of, right at the beginning of what was about to be the crash, I had put a deposit on a seven unit building and I was gonna have to redesign it, gut it and everything. Not pretty, not gut it, but really go in there and dig it out and take care of it and put it to the way I thought was fit for me. And I always thought if I buy a home or if I flip a home, 
it has to be a home that I can live in because I wouldn't want anybody to live in anything worse than that. Because if I could live in it, then I knew anybody could live in it because it would be a reflection of me. Right. So that's what I did as far as designing the home out, you know, to scale to where I was investing my money. I mean, it wasn't above, I would say it wasn't some ritzy home. It was pretty and beautiful, but it was for the level of the price point. Right. So I did, I flipped those two homes. I made a profit and then the market crashed. I was able to get my deposit back because of the crash of the market. And that kind of scared me. I should have um, stayed the course, but I didn't. I got out. And, you know, because I had never seen anything like that happening. You know, everybody was losing their homes and it was a scary time for a lot of people in America. Mm -hmm. So I kind of ran. And in retrospect, I wish I would have stayed the course because it would have been a totally different turnout mm -hmm. so, or outcome. And I didn't. I did not do that. So when I got here and I started working in real estate, I never, for, for the last past, I would say eight years, nine years, I didn't think about going back into the investing end of it. But as I saw my money pile up and stack, I was like, well, wait a minute, I'm getting this you know, BS interest on my money in the bank. I'm looking at it, I'm going and I'm counting it, but nothing's happening with it. Mm -hmm. So I said, why don't I take this and invest? And that's what I started doing. So now I'm a multi-unit investor and I don't invest where I live. Because I'll be honest with you, I can't afford, I can't afford to invest in Naples. <laughs> 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 and I'm not interested in flipping. I'm interested in, you know, doorsteps. So I invest in cities outside of Florida, states outside of Florida, which I'm happy with. Right. Well, you're lucky you're not in California. Uh, well, no, I probably couldn't afford that either. <laughs> but I am on my way to looking at, you know, anywhere between 40 and 50 doorsteps. That's my goal, you know, and beyond that. But that's where I am now. What are some of the hot states as far as getting multiple units? You feel? Um, I think I would say Detroit. I would say uh, probably Texas area. I would say definitely Chicago. Um, you probably could really dig into Philadelphia a little more if you look. Like, I'm from Philly. I would know exactly where to go and where to look. Right. So that's something different. It just depends. And being a real estate, you know, agent, broker, um, investor, I kind of know the ropes a little differently from, you know, the novice. So it's a little bit different. But right. trust me, there are some people out there that I like to hang on to their coattails a little bit. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> they're killing it. They're killing it out there. Well, I referred you one. I don't know if you gave him a, con uh, gave him a contact. I don't know if I got that from you. We can shoot it to me again. Don't worry. Shoot it to me again. <laughs> oh, don't tell everybody. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I won't. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that between you and I. Okay. Um, so it's 2008. You start doing you start brokering real estate and no i started selling real estate you started selling real estate i became an agent became in florida i was already an agent in new york city okay so you're already agent in new york city now you're an agent in florida um are you already kind of near the the top or are you starting out in the middle or are you starting out from the bottom when you started when you started out in 2008 how, where did you kind of start from when you, re, when you rebuilt in Florida? Oh, I started from the bottom. <laughs> I started from the bottom. I, like I said, I didn't know anything about this type of um, environment here. Mm -hmm. You know, the only time I was ever in Florida is when we came to party in Miami for spring break, you know. That's the only time I was hanging out in Florida. I mean, no one, in, no one would have ever told me that I was going to live in Florida at this stage in my life. Definitely, I thought I was going to be either in Italy or New York City or, a, you know, a totally me metropolitan city. I'm a city girl, you know. I've always lived in a condo. I, was, I mean, I was always a single woman. Mm -hmm. So, and I was a hustler. I was just out there hustling like everybody else. So to me, to, to have a house with a yard and a swimming pool and garages, I, that wasn't even in my mind. So, now, how, so how, do, how were you able to... So I know initially there was a really, now that was clever now too. So you said that you started to, uh, you switched to the charter 
flights. Right. And then that's how you met a lot of high level contacts. Were, were those same contacts that kind of the carryover to when you when you started out in Florida or did you have to restart that that kind um, of process? I, I didn't restart that process. I started from ground zero, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, I saw and realized where I was once I got here. After five or six months, and I mean, I couldn't imagine working for anybody. I wasn't going to go and stand in some store and sell people stuff that I was buying myself. I, this just didn't, I mean, to me, it was just beyond me. And nothing's wrong with that. It's just not something I wanted to do because I was always a creative and a business person, which can be a bit dangerous because yeah. when you're a creative and a business person, you know, you, you're balancing two heavy, heavy things that pull you in different directions. Yeah. And I've been, I've been able recently to fuse the two, which is a beautiful thing for me. Um, so when I came here and I saw that this area, this county, and started realizing I was in a very wealthy county, and I was reading the magazines and I was seeing these superstar real estate agents and I was saying to myself, oh, I can do that. Mm -hmm. I can do that. But it was, you know, easier said than done. Because when I started out, I had no idea how to navigate through that whole system to get the process down. To right. start ramping, you know, ramping up to really make the big bucks. So I had to do what Martin said. I had to crawl. <laughs> You know, I had to walk and then I started running and then I flew. So, you know, that was the process for me because I started out selling, you know, $90,000 condos, $100,000 condos, $135,000 condos. And, and not to say that that's not a lot of money because that's a lot of money to different people, mm -hmm. you know, and I never forget that. So when you're a real estate agent like myself, what we do is we keep the pipeline filled. You know, no matter what, I don't care if you have a $10 million listing, somewhere down the line, you got an $800,000 listing, you got a $200,000 listing, because that's what feeds you. Because when you sell property that properties that are, you know, anywhere between five and $10 million or anywhere between two and $5 million, those properties can sit on the market for quite some time. Mm -hmm. You have to have the financial and marketing wherewithal to carry them through. Right. And you are like, and thank God I'm a creative, you know, and I understood marketing, understood the digital age before everybody else did. You know, right. I put up a video that I did three, four years ago. They're talking about virtual, you know, tour now, tours now for real estate agents. I was doing that three, four years ago because I couldn't get to that client, that client that might have had that $20 million in their pocket to spend. So I had to bring him to me. <laughs> or you know them into my world so um i wanted to ask you about that and that was a game changer for me as well um understanding online the online space exactly uh, i'm not going to say i understand it completely <laughs> well, 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 the people really underestimate it um, they have no idea um i would say um how were you able to fill your pipeline because i have a, i have a sales background um around 14 years and there's different ways to fill your pipeline and before social media i was out there as a kid before social media on the phones right um, so I mean, <laughs> like most of what i did in my life uh was on the phone um and that's how i started down comedy was on the phone i picked up the phone there's exactly. local businesses in the area um i contact them get them on the phone see if i could sell them something um, how were you able to fill your pipeline when you started? What was your process like getting people into that pipeline? Was it on the phone? Was it in person? Were you, were you going from door to door? Were you online? How, how did it? I did all of those, all of the above. <laughs> um, initially when I first started out to be very, you know, candid about it, um, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I had no idea. I was like a hamster. I was a hamster on a hamster wheel, you know, chasing my tail. And I tell young agents that all the time, it takes time to grow into this position, to grow into that luxury category. You can get lucky once, but you know, people look at it and be like, that's luck. Because agents 
top agents, when they deal with you, if you, they don't know you, they don't know you by name, they start looking up your sales. And they start looking, by looking at your sales, they can tell from your experience mm -hmm. that if you haven't dealt with the $3 million or $5 million or $15 million client, you might get squashed out there. So I usually tell agents, if you are lucky enough to land that type of listing where it's anywhere above a million, five million, pair yourself up with an agent that really knows what they're doing and you will really learn something from them as far as the negotiating skills and framing that negotiation with that particular type of clientele. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, to digress here, no, I didn't know what I was doing. I, was, I did everything. I mean, in the beginning, I was calling and I was dialing with my fingers. I had no idea that there was like a dialing system. I was calling people. I was, I was calling 15 people in an hour. Then, you know, someone shared something with me. I was out one night at a birthday party for my broker. And I had gone to the seminar to see this uh, speaker. And he said, you know, oh, I can make you a millionaire in a, you know, in a year. You do what I say. And I was like, here we go. Somebody after my money again. I'm not going to give it up again. And I went and I, I went to the party and I shared with my girlfriend who was a agent also, but she was what we called like a, so she was on her way to being a super agent. Like I would look at her board and she was clocking down, I would say at least 50 to 120 grand a month. And I was like, wow, how are you doing it? And she was like, I'm doing what I do. And she didn't want to give up the secrets. And I told her, I said, you know, I went to this seminar today and I saw this guy and he was saying that, you know, I can make a million dollars in a year. And she was like, well, who was it? And I told her and she was like, well, yeah, you can. I said, what do you mean you can? And she said, because I did it. I said, well, I know you're doing it. I see your name on both sides of these boards, listings and sales every day. I come in, you know, each month because I work with Sotheby's and they're funny. That company, they put sales and listings right in your face. Mm -hmm. And let you know if you're a secret agent, guess what? <laughs> you're not on this board. And that's what they call us secret eight. Well, not me. They call them secret agents if you're not clocking down any dollars for them. Mm -hmm. Don't be a secret agent. I always say that. And my name just happened to be Jane Bond. So I always say, no, I'm not a secret <laughs> agent, baby. <laughs> no, I'm out here working. So, you know, I, I, when I shared that with her and she told me that she worked with this person, I was like, oh. And it was a coach. And I had heard all about these coaches and you have coaches coming from you from all different directions. I mean, I think they buy lists and come after agents like myself all day long. I can tell you, I get about 30 emails a day from different people trying to sell me things and more. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember thinking, I said to her, you know what, I'm signing up tomorrow. And she said, you go girl. And I signed up and he taught me the way. Mm. I mean, I'll never forget this. I was so anxious waiting for my coach to call me to send me his information because I wanted resumes. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted their resumes. Not only was I hiring you, not only were you going to take me on, I was taking you on. So I wanted to make sure we were partners and we both had something to bring to the table. I just didn't want some body that they had in the, you know, in, in their uh, group over there just to send me anybody. I wanted to make sure they were the right person or the and the right fit for me. And I'll never forget when I got his resume, I was like, oh my God, I will not be able to bullshit this guy. So I'm going to have to be on point every single day with him. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, I stuck with it the first night. I remember them saying, Jane, you do this the first 90 days and you will see a turnaround in your business. I took that to heart. I stuck with it for 90 days straight and I saw the turn. And when I mm -hmm. saw the turn, I had a ferocious attitude, you know, and I just went for it. And in nine, 90 days turned to, you know, six months, the six months turned to a year. I can tell you, I looked up and I was earning, I think, you know, prior to that, my first three years in real estate, I might have earned 60 grand or even less every year up until that first, the first three years, 2014, that's when my, my career and my life turned around as far as real estate was concerned, because that for, in two, the end of 2014, I made a half a million dollars and I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. And I was clocking down listings. 
the first million dollar listing I got, I was like, wow, then a $3 million, then $6 million, and it just kept coming. And you perfect your craft at that point. You know your script, you're like an actor. And I, I had taught and, and, <laughs> and managed actors. And I was like, well, you gotta know your script. You just can't go out there and act like you know what you're talking about. You gotta, you know, embrace what you're saying to these people and internalize it and be able to spit it back out to them whereas though you're believable. And not only that, you gotta show up. You gotta show up looking like success, Jane. And that's what I did. Mm -hmm. You know, and all that training came from living in New York City, traveling around the world, understanding what success looked like. Right. You know, because I had dealt with so many successful people up until that point. So I knew that when I got in front of them, I had to perform to play in their sandbox. Right. And trust me, when I realized that they liked what I was saying, that's when I really would turn it on and I would show up. Mm -hmm. You know, and I would always say, you know, I would look at other agents and I would say to myself, my God, they make, these guys are, I mean, they're making two and 300, some of them 300,000 a month. And they're showing up like that. I said, oh, no, I'm going to take it to another level. And that's what I did. Yeah. And before I knew it, my name was everywhere. I was like, and then it was easy because the name was easy. Yeah. And um, boom. Next thing I know, I was what they call the top agent. So I was really happy. And I've been at that space. I've been in that space since 14. So now, you know, my goal and 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 the way I see it now is it's time to pass that baton and teach other agents like myself who are in their head about getting there. And then when they say, well, you know, Jane, you know, how can I do this? You know, most of the clients that have that type of, you know, income are Caucasian. And I go, you can't talk anything to me because that's all I live around. I mean, that's my whole county. I'm, the, I'm like the only black agent here. <laughs> so right. get out of your head. You know, you just have to look the part, speak the part, and go and do your business and know your shit. Because if you know your shit, nobody can ever deny you. And if they deny you, then, then you know that's mm -hmm. something different. Right. And that's when, I, that's when I made that comment because... You know, I have some colleagues that say to me, Jane, you know, you have reached a certain level. Do you think that you are getting more work because of that? And no, I don't. You know, I, I know that where I am now in my career and where I am here in this area, I see so many more of my colleagues doing so much more. And it makes me wonder, but I can't get in my head because that's a dangerous place. Mm. You know, and I just, what I do wish and what I don't understand, and maybe it's because we're not as visible and for some, we have to find a way to be more visible to the black wealthy Americans that are out here because mm. they're not utilizing us. Or maybe we can't get through to them because they're liaisons and they're gatekeepers. And I understand that because that's I was a gatekeeper. Why. Yeah, it's gonna, that's going to be mainly why. It's the yeah. liaisons and gatekeepers. The people that are put in place for them before they... For those reasons. Them. Yeah. But you know what? Um, it's, even though they're put in place for those reasons, why not utilize? Why not you know, seek us out? Because we're out here. I can name a good eight, nine, ten of them off the top of my head, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, why not seek us out, though? Yeah. Um, we're just not... I don't think most of us are... We're I mean, do they think we're not here at the top of our game? Well, no, we're generally not trained to think that way. For example, other groups, they're, they're, they default to that. Okay, let's say if you're Chinese or you're Japanese or you're right. Mexican or Jewish or whatever, any ethnic group, they default to, I'm going to help my group get here. And this. And I think that we are a little bit afraid because we know that when we've 
gathered and other times, uh, both in the past and present, we've generally been targeted or attacked or there's a complaint or something. And so I, right. think that, I really think that there's a fear. I think that some people may, may even want to, but subconsciously the fear is so strong. Mm. But we're not allowed to say black in public. Oh. Uh, we speak, hey, that, that the wrong person. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, but a lot of people believe that, and, and you can see this every day if you're trying to tell them, I don't watch TV, but I know that if you do watch TV, whenever, like, let's say it's a political problem, they'll say, um, that you can't just say black. We want to help out the black community or black schools or whatever. You can't say that. You have to say, we're going to help out black and brown people. We're going to say, you have to phrase it in a way so that it's digestible for the general public. So we right. you know that if you just say black, it can be seen as a threat. Whereas everybody else doesn't have to do that. They could just, they can say, we're going to help out the gay community. We're going to help out the Latino community. We're going to help out the Chinese community. They can say whatever they want. But when it comes to black people, they're not allowed to say explicitly say black. You have to say, uh, we're going to help out everybody. It may be us. Um, because we know that that's actually a shame because we're, we're basically subconsciously telling ourselves that we know that we're under attack really by saying that because you're, you're saying, I can't say who I am. That means subconsciously you must feel like you're under attack. Well, you know, fortunately I never feel like I'm under attack when I have, you know, when I'm being open or are talking about my people. I mean, even when people say to me, what's your mix? I'm like, what mix? I am black all day long. When I look in that mirror and I wake up, I am black. So, you know, um, I, I don't get that, to be honest with you. Yeah, I really it's don't. It's a funny thing, because I remember one of my clients saying to me, she was from Tennessee. She was like, I hope you don't mind, but I told my domestic that, you know, there was an African-American lady that would be coming by that's my realtor. And I looked at her and I said, why didn't you just tell her I was black? And she <laughs> gave me this really surprised look. And she said, I don't, I don't know. And I said, you know, and I said, Mary, when I describe you, I describe you as white. I said, and when you see me, I'm black. So, you know, stop being politically correct with me. And from that day on, we've been friends. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and I told her, I said, you know, there's no, you don't have to hush, hush. I'm black. I'm black, period. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's no ifs and ands and buts here. I am who I am. Right. And trust me, I can get down with the best <laughs> when I tell you. So, yeah, yeah, that's that. Yeah, it's just, I, it's just that most people, they, they feel that fear. They feel that fear and um, that's, why, that's why we get that. So it's hard for us to connect as long as there's that fear there. Um, but, you know, I think as time's going on, this is dropping a little bit, you know, and, right. and, and that's good because I've noticed because I know because, um, shoot. <laughs> Not shoot. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking back like, like 15 years ago, um, people weren't as openly uh, saying things like this. I'll tell you that right now. They just weren't. Especially yeah, yeah, and I can, I, I definitely can appreciate that. I mean, I can reflect back on certain times too. Yeah. However, you know, it could be different for a female when you're in certain situations, also. Mm -hmm. You know, and I have a friend, and we always talk about things. And I said, you know, it, it's a funny thing. I'm always invited to the party. I said, um, and I've seen people that have come along with me and been treated differently. Mm -hmm. And I said, it hurts me to my heart, you know, and I, I can tell you, even in my own family, I've seen it happen, you know, down south, you know, with uh, family members. So I get that. And I think that we have to have the confidence in ourselves also mm -hmm. to be able to handle certain things when right. we're out there and when we're dealing with people in business. Right. You know, that emotional button sometimes really can get us in trouble, you know, and they have something you, you call EQ, emotional intelligence. And you have to learn how to work with that and understand how other people are feeling at that time. So yeah. you know how to bring forth the person you need to be at that moment in right. time. So 
you know, I hear that a lot, you know, we're too emotional or whatever. And I think it's what you said. Mm -hmm. It's the fear. Fear. But you have to overcome that fear to be out here to play in this big world. Right. And that's in any game that you get into, especially business. Yeah, especially. And not only that, you have to show up correctly. You can't show up looking like the boy from the hood. You got to show up looking like the man that's about to do the business. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I can respect what Robert was saying, you know, as far as racism at another level and the circle gets smaller and you're able to not be around that so much. But you know when it's there. You know when you, you can feel it, you smell it, you see it. And you have to know how to navigate through it mm -hmm. to get what you need. Yeah. Because if not, you're going to lose no matter what. Mm -hmm. So that's why I commented because I understood what he was saying. It right. definitely resonated with me. You know, and then I saw some of the other comments and I thought, that's the fear. When I read some of the other comments, I said, you know, what you're speaking about now, that fear, it was in those comments. Yeah. Because I, I I felt and saw something completely different because I'm at a certain level in my life. Right. That's why I was good. That's why I was mentioning earlier is that most people won't be able to really understand it completely because most people aren't there to understand it. Um, I kind of hinted toward that earlier. It, and as you progress, um, you'll realize how things work. I mean, just even as simple as, uh, I mean, I wanted to ask you about something else, but I'll just, just to finish this off, I mean, even as simple as um, in the education system, when you're going to uh, more, more prestigious colleges, um, you'll get that same thing there. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, racism is institutionalized. Yeah. <laughs> in the, the particular type where they're not saying that, oh, why don't you get your stuff together? That's not the complaint anymore. No. The complaint becomes, why is your stuff so together? Really? That's really what they're saying. Why and then that's the threat. threat? Well, you that's the threat. As well. I told you to put yourself up by a bootstraps, but I didn't mean that to actually put the bootstraps on. I didn't mean for you to do and that. And tighten them up. <laughs> <laughs> tighten them up. Go running. You know, David Goggins running with broken legs. And stuff. Okay. Like that's, I didn't mean for you to do that. I didn't really that's right. Boots on. I was just saying that, you know. You find that out. You find out. It doesn't matter whether you 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 put the bootstraps on or you or you or you or you don't put them on or they they're kind of hanging off. It doesn't matter where your boots yeah. are. If somebody's gonna say do and or something that impacts your life from a racial standpoint. Still, it's gonna, it's gonna happen. Um, and on top of that, what I wanted to ask earlier. So you mentioned that. Before you made that turn, you had done, you know, 60 grand a year, you know, just kind of putting along. And then you got in the right partnership, had the right mentorship and, and something changed and you hit it after that first 90 days. What are some of the critical elements that allowed you to make that shift? What are some things that you changed in your approach? Because a lot of agents and a lot of not just agents, but other people in business in general, we will want to know what are some of the main things that you changed that made it go? I just, it was like fire. You know, I had this, I knew what my why was. And my why was to make sure my mother was taken care of. And there was an incident that happened. And I was like, I'm the only one that can handle this. I'm the only one that's going to be able to make this happen. Now, whether I make it happen now or in 10 years, it has to happen. And it had to happen way before 10 years. Mm -hmm. So when that incident happened, it killed me. And, you know, I couldn't go to my siblings at that point. I had to make shit happen. Mm -hmm. So I put a plan together. I said, you know, I gave this guy my credit card. I didn't, I couldn't even share with my husband at the time. You know, I had my house. I thank God I had tenants in my house at the time. Then when the tenants moved out, I had two years of paying my own mortgage because I didn't want to lose my house. You know, I'm an independent black woman, so I'm not giving up my house so soon. <laughs> you know, I always say, nobody told me I had to give up my stuff. So, you know, I was trying to hang on to that. I had like $75,000 worth of debt. And 
I, I mean, I had my mother who needed me to go in and redo her whole bathroom and kitchen, like gut it out because, you know, she was becoming, you know, a senior citizen in her homes. My mother's like 81 years old, you mm -hmm. know, and she couldn't get out her tub and she, she didn't have a shower. I had to make those things happen. I, I couldn't bear knowing that I was living a certain way and my mother wasn't. So, and I couldn't lumber my husband with that. I mean, that's not something I was just too proud. I didn't even tell him. Right. So, you know, what I did was I put a plan together and I said, if this man can make me a millionaire, there's no turning back. This is it, Jane. I became fiercely committed mm -hmm. to what I was supposed to do. I was up at five in the morning and I knew to strengthen my mind, I had to strengthen my body first. I would work out. I would go to work. I was at the office before they opened the office. People would laugh at me. Oh, I see your car in front of the office at 6.30, 7 a.m. I was in there working. I would go in there, turn the lights on, make the coffee, bring the paper in, and go upstairs and close the door and start calling. I was dialing for dollars. You don't know how many times people told me, you know, cursed me out, called me all kinds of names outside of my name, tell me who, I was a liar because I wasn't Jane Bond. I mean, it was crazy, but I stayed the course. <laughs> oh, my God, you have no idea. Um, and um, I just stayed the course. Mm -hmm. I stayed fiercely committed to what I was supposed to do for 90 days. And I have to say, at that 90, 100 days, I saw the business turning. I started getting calls. I started going on appointments. I started talking to people. I started knocking on doors. I was like, you know what? I need that next listing. If I'm going to get this listing for 500000 I'm going to knock on every door around this listing to let them know this is mine. And I'm out here sweating. I mean, it was 90 degrees. I'm knocking on doors. They're like, oh, my God, do you want to come in? It's really hot out there. So they felt bad for me sometimes. But I did everything. I knocked on doors. I did postcards. I mean, I didn't go to the country clubs because I just didn't. That's not what I wanted to do. And not only that, you would have to belong to them, mm -hmm. you know. So I would just, like, go out there and walk around and knock on doors, t talk to people. I would never tell anybody when I went out, you know, for dinner or anything that I was a real estate agent. I just felt like, oh, no, I'm not doing that. This is off time. But I stayed fiercely committed to dialing for dollars. And not a lot of agents do that or did that at the time. Some were doing it, but everybody wasn't hip to it. Now everybody does it. It's a little bit different. So you have to become creative. And it's funny because my buddy and I had this conversation about four years ago. What's going to happen when you're not going to be able to call these people? Because you definitely can't call them now. Nobody even wants you in their homes now. So the tide has changed. And the question is, are you prepared for this tide that has changed? How are you going to navigate through this new normal, being an agent and trying to become a top agent and, you know, grow into the luxury market? So, you know, it's, it's very important for new agents, young agents, um, even uh, seasoned agents, to really revamp their business. But that's how I did it when I was coming up. I, I, like I said, I became fiercely committed and confident. And I went out there and I nailed it every time. And trust me, the first time I went out there, I'll never forget, I, was, I sat in my car for an hour going over my script, internalizing it and, and being able to share it with the people when I would go in. And once I got it down pat, it was just a different property. Now I just have to research the property. I already know what to say. I, need, I knew what to, you know, bring. I knew my plan of action right. when I stepped across that threshold. And trust me, they were always surprised to see me. <laughs> so you, you, I think everybody, had, everybody must get to this point because I, I think it's no different with me. Is you get to a point where you can't go back. Oh, no. And you must know your why. You know, people think that's a cliche in our business. You right. must know your why. And that why has to be bigger than anything else. Right. It, 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 has to, it has to have a very, very deep meaning. Yes. You never really think about the underlying uh, dollar amount, per se. It has a, it, there's a deeper drive. And you feel like you, in, in my case, you feel like 
you're just going to have to kill me if I have to live the way I was living. Oh, yeah. And you know what? It can't be about the money. No, it's never because about the that. money always comes. I always tell people it can't be about the money because the money that comes yeah. and it definitely goes. But, yeah. you know, if it's about the money, you'll never get it. But if yeah. it's about what's inside of you mm -hmm. and success looks different to everybody. Yeah. Everybody's everybody, different. Right. Success means something different to everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have to understand what that is and what that looks like for you. Right. You know, it, it, it's always something very deep. There's always like a turning point. I noticed that with people, there's always a, a turning. There's some point where you're just like, no more. Yeah, you shift because yeah. you have to. It's, it, you have to. You have no other choice. And that's when I said, I said, there's no going back, Jane. Right. If you go back. Burn the bridges. Right. You make sure you can't go back. Right. I'm really offended when people ask me if I have a job. I'm like, no, I don't have a job. Are you insane? <laughs> <laughs> like, you think I, you, you think I was up all night and doing all this stuff to have a job? That was the whole right. exactly for me. I mean, to be frank, I hate to touch on race again, but it, it was really corporate racism that drew, drove me to say no mas. I was right. like oh, Duran, uh, and uh, I just you know. <laughs> If anybody remembers that fight, he just he's just like forget it. You know, I remember. You know, it, it depends on your lifestyle, how you want to live, the way you live. What you know, what what does it mean to you? Mm -hmm. You know, and people, oh, I want to wear this. I want to have this. You know, you can't wear but one watch at a time. You can't wear but one beautiful bag at a time. I mean, and after a while, they become like old shoes. Right. You know, you're ready for the next thing. And trying to keep up with the Joneses to keep your ass broke. <laughs> you know? I, so, think you, I think you care less, too, in the midst of it, like when you're building a business. I think that the, the way you thought um, certain amounts of money would make you feel or uh, certain things that you may have thought about that you wanted to buy or at least in, at least in how I feel about things. I feel like I feel a little bit different than I thought I would feel. And I'm not as rich as I'll become, but um, I just feel I like that. I'm not as rich as I'll become. You better say that. Come on now, David. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I can, but I can, I don't feel like, um, I don't feel how I thought I would, would feel. And I don't feel that the, um, you know, it's kind of hard to explain, you know, because you have like these visions in your head, right? And you're thinking about them. It's, you know what it is? It's kind of like this. Sometimes people think about having a lot of money, right? Right. Um, when, you're, when, you're, when, you're, when you're poor, I mean, when you're just working every day, and you're just like, you know, I want to have a lot of money. I want to have millions of dollars or whatever. You're not thinking about the business part, the suing people, the, uh, the, 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 the battles, the, um, the fighting with people on the phone, the, 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 uh, oh. the, you're not thinking about all the crazy stuff, all the, uh, uh, the, the power games and this and that. You're not Absolutely. thinking about all that. You're just thinking about the money and what you would do with money given your same situation right now. It doesn't work that way. What happens yeah. is your life changes with the money and then all the problems, the problems change. So the problems flip. Right. So you might have been, you might have been shorted on your check, right? Imagine like times that by 20 or times that by 30, and that's what you're going to be shorted when somebody screws you on a deal. Oh. Stuff like that. <laughs> that's what, you see what I'm saying. It's just right. like problems change, and then you have to deal with that yourself. It's not your boss that you're going to point to to go deal with it. You're going to deal with it. Right. You're going to have to call that person. You're going to have to. Uh, put whatever you have to do together legally or whatever. You're Absolutely. Responsible. Yeah. Now, and then you'll have other people you're responsible for, other lives. You're an employer. You'll have other lives that you're responsible for, so on and so forth, and you think differently than... So when you actually get to the destination, I think it feels different than you initially thought when, you know, when you're in that hole in the wall, you know, doing what you gotta do. When you actually start arriving there it feels differently than you thought it would and i think oh, that the materials, definitely. the materials come much later 
as you know, as you were ascending, you were probably not thinking like, hey, I'm going to go get a Rolls Royce or I'm going to. Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> trenches. You don't feel yeah. like, uh, how you think, even, even at that level, you'll think that when you go to, oh, oh, I'm making six figures. You realize six figures isn't a lot of money. That's and it's not, not enough. <laughs> not a lot of money. It's not enough. So then you're like, oh, dang, I thought that was going to be a lot. Because right. when you were making 40 grand, right. you if you made 200, it would be different. Exactly. Clearly, this is a business now. So now you have other expenses, you have other problems. So it's never like how people think in their head. And I think that people should always think about things in a deeper, from a deeper space. So when they do get there and they do arrive, they're happier. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I remember, I remember when, when I broke a certain number. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking before I broke that number, I was going to different, I would go out to dinner and, you know, we have a, a, a area and I would walk through that area and I would think, wow, I'm going to be able to buy that, that, this, yes. <laughs> That's going to be cool. <laughs> you know? And I remember thinking after a while, I went, I don't need it. What? Right. Yeah, but I mean. You feel differently then. Right. When, when I didn't have it, I really wanted it. Yeah. When I got it, when I got the paycheck to be able to go and spend that kind of money, and I mean spend it in an abundance. You don't want to. I didn't want to. It it's wasn't that important to me. No, I don't and care. And that no. was another shift. The fabrication you're in our right. minds. That was it, another shift for me, I believe. And I started realizing, no. And then the, third, the, the last shift lately was, oh, no, I need to make this money so I can buy this next building. Right. And that was the six figures. I mean, it went from needing, you know, 50, 60 to 200 grand to 300 grand to put down on these buildings to create, you know, financial right. wealth. Right. And, and, and gain leverage. Mm-hmm. You know, because that's the name of the game real mm-hmm. estate, leverage, no, real estate, equity, leverage, mm-hmm. wealth. Right. That's the name of the game, no matter which way you look at it. And mm-hmm. once you realize that, and um, so many wealthy people out there, they know the game. <laughs> mm-hmm. You put your money in real estate, you're going to be fine. You, can, you got equity, you grab it out. Mm-hmm. You got leverage, <laughs> you use that leverage. And that's how it works. And until you get to that point, all those other things will still be important to you. Mm-hmm. Driving that nice car, having that new handbag, and I think a lot of us are becoming smarter, you know, because I'm on my podcast, I have from execution to excellence. I hear the same story, which is my story. And I love hearing it over and over and over again, because you get through that. And next thing you know, you don't think about those things. You don't think about that pocketbook, those, you know, Bhutan shoes. I don't even think about that kind of shit. I see, you know, I see that, all that stuff now. I see that as marketing. It is marketing. It's marketing. It is. I mean, and, and we fall for it. It's smart, but it's, it, you, it can only, it only has value as it relates to, unless you really, really like, let's say you really love car. I like cars, stuff like that. That's cool. But still my rational mind exactly. considers, it, considers it marketing. All, all those things can be used for is to make more money by using the marketing that comes from this whatever special thing that you buy, especially in real estate. Now I know you guys. You guys will have a a seven series BMW with five thousand in the account because you know that if, if that could that could be that one deal that you need. That's right. It's all about marketing and and perception and stuff at that point. So I feel like um, I really feel like it's just a marketing expense. Um, just like and it is a marketing expense. Trust yeah. me. <laughs> the yeah. show up right is a marketing expense. Yeah. And, you, and you're able to write it off if you're smart enough. Yeah. There are you know, write-offs for it. All of that, you know, understand, being financial literate and understanding that, all that is foundational too, you know. And a lot of us wasn't taught that at home. We mm-hmm. weren't taught about credit. We weren't taught about finance. You know, we weren't taught how to save. And the ones that were, were lucky. Yeah, very and, lucky. And the ones that were taught those things, you can see it in them today. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the unfortunate part is we, we all, we didn't have that in our homes because our parents were living paycheck to paycheck. 
and most of us come from big families. Mm -hmm. And even if you came from two, they were still living paycheck to paycheck, no matter if they were a nurse, you know, everybody goes to school to be a nurse, everybody goes to school to be a bank, you know, go to be a bank teller. Those were the jobs in the, from the hood, mm -hmm. you know? And I, it's funny because I always told my nephews, think bigger. What would happen if you think big? It doesn't cost you anything. And then what would happen if you executed on those thoughts? You know, because we weren't taught that in our homes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to chill, the kids of today are a little bit smarter. They have access. And even the ones that have access, some of them aren't utilizing it properly. No, they're not. And that's unfortunate. You know, and, and I have to say, Robert Smith, you know, when he went back and he paid for all those kids' college education, that was one man who put his money where his mouth was, you know? And I was like, brother, <laughs> you can't do, nobody can say anything to you. Hands down, you have blew it out the water this time. Yeah. So, you know, and he came back on the scene because nobody had seen him for a while. Mm -hmm. You know, his relevance just, just <laughs> and, yeah. I mean, and now to see him speak and, 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 talk about life and talk about, you know, our black and white world, which we live in and we'll live in this world, you know, until I'm gone, long after I'm gone. You know, it, it's something that we should really listen to mm -hmm. and not judge him, you know, on other things that have nothing to do with us. Mm -hmm. First of all, it's not our business. Stay out of that man's house. Yeah, like who? I saw the comments. I know the comments you're talking about. Right, stay out of that man's house. Matter of fact, stay out of his bedroom. Who's he? Who's he? Who he's married to? And all doesn't that. matter. It's not it has nothing to do with you. He's mm -hmm. doing what he has to do. Right. You know, but um, to That's say that <laughs> right. <laughs> comment I see after I, I and get know. out of his pocket. Yeah. Stop pocket watching. Exactly. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah why you post him? He's got he's got a white wife for. Oh, why you post him? He he ain't do nothing. I'm like, dude, what does he have to do? <laughs> I, I can't even comment on that. Why don't you go pay for, you go pay for a whole class of people? Why don't you like, why don't you go pay for them? Let's right. see what you did. Uh, most people don't even donate ten dollars out of their work check exactly for some cause or something that has to do with any community, let alone the black one. So um, I just you know I just kind of just let people just. I let, as long as it's not too crazy or disrespectful, I just let people just say all kind of crazy stuff they want to say. Um, <laughs> and just leave it, you know, and just leave it there. So I know we touched on this briefly, um, but I wanted to give you a chance to talk about what you're working on now. Because um, I know you have a motivation to make more, more use. Mm. In a, in, a, in a sense, of course, the story will all be unique to themselves, but to give the guidance, kind of giving back, just like how somebody gave back to you and, and show you the ropes and you want to show the people some ropes. So how, how, what's, what's going on with that? Give us well, I, I have a book coming out okay. that tells you from A to Z how I did it. Um, and I think if you follow that, you, you can't lose. I mean, it tells you, ex I tell you exactly what I did, how I did it when I started, how I ended up, and I'm still moving. Mm -hmm. So um, I have a book that's coming out. It's called um, How to Land Your First Million Dollar Listing and Become a Top Agent in Your Market. Um, I have a podcast called From Execution to Excellence, and I interview influencers from around the country who have broken through to success. And they share with people how they navigate now and then. Um, I'm also working on um, a membership group for luxury agents where they can come in and learn everything they need to know about luxury. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to roll that out probably next month. And wow. it's affordable because I find everywhere I go to speak about this market and every market is different. I mean, there's mar I mean, we have houses on the market here that can go from 30 million to 88 million to 90 million at any given time. I mean, I've rolled by houses yesterday that not yesterday, like the weekend. Yeah, yesterday. Saturday I went down there. Um, just to get out the house and have a drive. 
houses are on the market for $72 million. Yeah. Five acres on the beach. I mean, and we're not Palm Beach. Right. We're Naples. We're right. on the West Coast. You know, there's, Miami is on the East Coast and right. Naples is on the West Coast. We're on the Gulf of Mexico and Miami is on the Atlantic Ocean. Right. So, and over here, I mean, the wealth per capita is insane. It's insane. Mm -hmm. You know, we're like the Beverly Hills of the East Coast. Mm -hmm. We're different from Palm Beach. Palm Beach is pretty incestuous. You know, you, if you didn't grow up there, you might as well not even go there. <laughs> okay. Right. Miami, you know, is South America, you know, it's full of South Americans mm -hmm. and um, people from all over the world. Mm -hmm. We have some of the wealthiest Americans that have made their money from, you know, hard work here mm -hmm. in Naples. Captains, titans that have laid their hats down here. Mm -hmm. And um, you don't even know who you're sitting next to. On that note, I wanted to ask you too. I almost forgot. Um, <laughs> when you, how did you land your first uh, big time deal? Like where it broke you into luxury? How how did that happen? Crawling, <laughs> begging. Um, my first uh, million dollar deal I had was uh, I had a colleague at another uh, brokerage that called me and said, um, I don't live in Naples, and I know you know Naples. And that, co that same colleague asked me to join his team. Um, and um, I remember saying to him, and he, I know nothing, I didn't know anything, trust me, I was a rookie. I won the rookie of the year there though, <laughs> because I sold volume. Right. They might, I might have sold 90 and 100 and you know, $150,000 condos, but I was selling in volume. Mm -hmm. And um, he came to me and he said, I like, the way you dress, I like the way you look, I like the way you speak. Would you like to join my team? And I said, doing what? And he said, as a buyer's agent. Well, I didn't even know what that meant at the time. And I said, you know, I said, oh, I said, I don't know. I said, what does that mean? And he shared a little bit about it with me. And um, I said, you know, I need to go home and have a conversation. I said, and I'll come back to you tomorrow. I said, don't write me off. I'm not saying no. So I went home and I thought about it and I didn't have a conversation. I just thought about it. I looked up buyer's agent and I, I came back and I said, so, you know, what would my split be with you? Because as, as agents, first thing we think about is our money. So what are you going to give me? What's my split? And he told me to split. And I said, and you're the lead agent. And he said, yes. And I said, well, I think I could do what you're doing. I said, I don't think I need to join a team. I said, but I am so flattered that you asked me because that made me realize that I could do what you're doing, you know? And, and I thought, well, why should I work with him as a buyer's agent, give him, you know, almost half of my money and don't have any of this glory like he does. Mm -hmm. And that was the thought process. So, you know, and then I worked there for quite some time and I left the company and I joined Sotheby's and I was doing well at Sotheby's and he called me. And I, would, I couldn't get past, I remember I kept thinking, I can't get past 600,000. My listings were five and four and six. And he called me one day and he said, I have a referral for you. And he said, um, this young lady, and it was the same lady who said she, you know, I told my domestic that, a, you know, African-American woman will be coming by. <laughs> and, um, he said, um, she, she wants to buy a property. I don't live in Naples. You know Naples better than I do. I see your name, you know, out there somewhat. And I trust you because I know you know your business. And um, he said, she's going to spend about $2 million. So I was like, wow, he's giving me a buyer that he doesn't want to handle because he doesn't know Naples, which made sense. You know, and if it was me, I would have learned Naples. And he was only in the next county. And um, he gave me this buyer. And she, when I sat with her and talked to her about everything, she was spending $5 million, not $2 million. Then when I met her husband, he peeled it all the way back. He said, we're not going over three. So it took me nine months to find the property for him. But I stuck with it and I found that property. And when I negotiated that deal, I negotiated well with a top agent. 
And she said, I am so impressed. She said, this was the smoothest transaction I have ever dealt with. And from that day on, I started listing big properties. Mm. I made that sell. And that was the first one. And I'll never forget, I thought, oh my God, this is it. This is it. But it wasn't it. (laughs) I had to do it all over again. So it doesn't matter where you go. doesn't matter how high you go. You have to get up and do this all over again the next day because you're only as good as your last sale. Mm -hmm. And I remember that when I closed that deal and I got that check, I was like, wow, so this is what it feels like to get something, you know, get this type of money. And then that was it. You know, I had to do it all over again because that wasn't going to sustain me, you know, it wasn't going to sustain me. (laughs) But that was the first, that was my first deal. But when I got my coach, And I started rolling into it because the real deal about being a real estate agent is you have to be a listing agent. Mm. The listing agent is the one with the prize because no matter what, you're going to get paid. If you're a buyer's agent, you don't know if the buyer's going to buy from you or go out on her own and find something where somebody's sitting there and sign a contract without you. You know, that's a toss up. But as the listing agent, your name is on that property. You're able to market that property and leverage everything because that's what you need to get your name out there. If you have one listing, you can leverage that listing for other listings Mm. because no matter what, you're going to get paid. As long as you have the marketing wherewithal, the financial wherewithal to keep that property on the market and keep your name out there, you can get another property but you can't have one property and then it goes away and you don't sell it or it expires and there's nothing left in the pipeline, then you're in trouble. Right. Then you got to start all over again. And to be clear for the, for the audience who may not know the difference between a listing agent, a buying agent, I guess what a, what a, a way to, break it down would to say would be to say the listing agent is so, uh, somewhat the marketer the listing agent is the yeah the listing agent is the marketer marketeer right they're a marketeer and that's what you have to be when you're a listing agent and the listing agent is the boss they hold the cards because every buyer agent is going to bring their client to see your property right so no matter what that property is still yours your name is on it you hold the cards that's the difference Mm -hmm. because you have the client you're not sure that you have the client when you have a buyer i don't care what you do i don't care if you qualify them you go out with them for eight nine months they can go and see a property and you're not there Mm -hmm. and they'll sign on the dotted line and say well you know i didn't know (laughs) you didn't work with them for four months and they just walked into an open house and bought a property without you Wow. And no matter how many times you get, you try and get them to sign that uh, paperwork as far as saying that you are their agent as a buyer's agent, that's only as good as the person that signs it. Yeah. So and that's you, with a lot of stuff. Yeah, that's with a lot of stuff. NBAs, <laughs> non-disclosures, it's only good as the person that signs it. Yeah. You know, so you, it, I always say, you know, it's best to be a listing agent because you know you're going to get paid. Mm-hmm. As long as you can sell that property. But when you're a listing agent, you have listing agent, you have to market that property. And that's what's important. And I mean, you have to cast that net. You know, real estate is local. It's very localized. And you need to get out there and network with the other agents that are able to bring that customer to your listing. You know, because sometimes they won't even bring the customer to your listing, depending on how well you're doing. They're like, well, I'm I'm not taking my customer there. Better sell it to somebody else. I mean, I felt that here. You know, I I got a big listing. I got an $8 million listing. Mm -hmm. I don't see any of my colleagues who I know have these buyers. What's that about? They don't show up? (laughs) So it just depends. Right. But I would say, you know, if you want to become a listing agent, because it's not just selling real estate, it's, it's marketing real estate. 
and you have to be a good salesperson. Mm -hmm. You have to know how to sell. So essentially it comes down to, I, I see that whole thing, the, the concept of marketing and sales as understanding how people think in large numbers. That's how I quantify my head. And it helps me understand things a lot better. Um, so I, in the sense, I ignore what people say they like and only focus on people, what people actually like. So I will ignore when I, when I see a complaint on even, even uh, in terms of uh, Instagram, which is all about marketing. <laughs> yeah, right. Marketing central will teach you everything. It teach you so much about marketing, just doing it, even if you have a marketing background like myself. But when somebody complains on the type of post, right? Let's say I see a complaint in the comments. They say, well, why did you post this? Da, 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 da. But when I look at the views and saves and sends, and they're all maxed out. Right. Doing fantastic. All I'm thinking is I'm posting what you and everybody else really wanted me to post at a subconscious level. Exactly. That's why I posted it, because this is a business and I have to sell. So exactly. if this is a business, I have to focus on, and it, I love teaching and entertaining people. That's what I always wanted to do that. But at the same time, this is a business. If everybody wants to see something, <laughs> <laughs> then I have to give them what they want to, what they told me they want to see. Not what, right. they, not what they said, like this. Right, right. What they said, like, like this, you know, looking through and actually interacting. And that's, that's what, what I have to go by. So I've, I've learned how to just say, oh, oh, okay, you say you want this, all right, just kind of just in one ear and out Because other. people will tell you what they want. You just got to listen. They'll tell you a million things, but. Oh, they will tell you what. You can have the best focus groups on Instagram. And don't even know. <laughs> yeah, but it's it definitely it's about selling. You know, you got to sell. You know, one of my colleagues said to me, mm -hmm. you know, you got to know when the buyer's in the house. Mm -hmm. You know, even as a listing agent, you have to know when the buyer's in the house. So if you know when the buyer's in the house, you know what type of dialogue you should have. Right. And then you have to frame the negotiations to get the deal done. Mm -hmm. And that takes experience. Yep. You know, and if you don't have that kind of experience, you might lose that buyer that's sitting right there. You have to recognize that they're in the house at that time. And there's also credit to you because what you're really doing is you're understanding what they're really saying. Exactly. I'm listening to what they want. Right. They could be saying a million things, but you have to understand what they're and this might sound, people might sound, oh, this sounds crazy or whatever. But you have to understand well, like, what their spirit wants, basically, exactly. is what I'm saying. You have to understand what's really emanating from them without them saying it. They may say it and they may not. They usually do not. But it's your job to pick that up. Oh, and you have to peel those layers back. Yeah. Peel yeah, you definitely back. have to peel the layers back. Yep. Peel and, and, you know, not only that, for my agents out there, you have to learn how to peel those layers back and listen. You have to listen to the cues that they are giving you because they might say they want this, but you know better that that's, you know, just because it's like, wow, they might write a contract and then go home and have buyer's remorse because you weren't listening. Right. And you have to be able to say to them, oh, no, that's not what you said you wanted. You know, right. I, we had a checklist. Let's tick this off properly. And yeah. not, only, not only that, you know, you, you, you have to be able to, when you're on the list side, you have to walk into somebody's home and know what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. You can't walk in there and go on a four, five, six million dollar listing and don't even know, you know, what type of floors you're looking at or what type of artwork these people or who these people mm -hmm. are. Because you can be calling, you get there and trust me, the lady of the house, she's going to know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because she's judging you from the moment you walk through that door. Right. And if it's, if it's not up to her and it's up to the husband, he might come in there and say, oh, no, she's not the right agent to sell this house. Mm -hmm. And they, they'll share with you. Being able I don't to think you're the right agent to sell this house. I don't think you can handle this. Right. Being able to relate to the demographic and being able to speak oh. their language. You have to speak their language. Yeah. 
you know, and you have to be a strong negotiator. And you know, you have to pick up the phone. We are not paper pushers. We do not write an offer and then send the offer in. Have a conversation with that other agent. Mm -hmm. Especially if your client, you know, your, your buyer is a low ball, you know, buyer. He want a low ball, you know, you can't insult people. Mm -hmm. So if your buyer is that person and you know he has or she has the room to move up, it's your job to call that other agent and have a heart to heart conversation with them and share with them that this is your buyer. However, we're coming in at this level, not to insult you, but we do have room. All we're looking for is a counter. You have to have those conversations. You just can't put an offer in. And, you know, I remember being a young agent putting an offer in for, I think it was a $3.9 million property. He put it in for, I think it was 3 2 mm. I didn't even get a response. And it was with one of my colleagues. She didn't even qualify my offer and told me because it was insulting. So I had to learn that myself. And my guy ended up buying a 4.7 condo, $4.7 million condo as opposed to that 3.9 cash, all cash closed in 10 days. And you avoid that by getting on the phone with them, correct? Absolutely. Making that call, right. Making that call because the other agent is going to say, listen, this is where my seller wants to be. And we might not get there. <laughs> so you, if you have that conversation, there's no need to waste anybody's time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point, especially for the modern day. And that's experience. That comes along with experience. You just don't put the contract. Pick up the phone. Right. We're people. We're not robots. Pick up the phone and have a conversation. Yeah. You never know if that's going to go through or not. You might, you just might get a deal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's funny because it's, it's like that in so many things. I think that a lot of the young uh, men and women coming up may not realize that a lot of the time because of social media and the exactly. internet. And I'm just old enough to where I was, I kind of bridge between like the brand new kids and like the older people. I'm like right in the, in the middle. And I was on the phone young enough and long enough to understand the value of talking to people and making everything a people party. And it has to be, there has to be a real inter human interaction. Oh, absolutely. And I'm, I'm big on that. And I think for the age demographic that I'm around, it's not as common. And for people who are younger than me, it's definitely not as common because of social media and the internet and stuff. So it's something that really has to be learned. I mean, they used to, when I was a kid, they just throw me on the phone. <laughs> like, like, it doesn't matter what it is. What, what, what's your name? What's your name was? Yeah. It's the phone. You know, and that, that's only, that's what I was getting. That's what I had to do. That's so, right. But that's how you learn. Yeah. It, it forces you to have to learn how to deal with people, especially as it pertains to business and stuff like that, how to pick up the phone. Um, and there's a, there's like a fear, a phobia, again, a fear again, of <laughs> picking up the phone and what comes next. Right. You're going to pick up the phone. They're going to tell you they're full of it. I laughed so hard earlier because, you know, people will talk about your name and say <laughs> a lot. Uh, that's, that's funny. Uh, you know, they're going to call you names. Um, they're going to say, ah, yeah, I know how to do this. I know, how to, you know, they just look, saying they know how to do stuff that they really don't know how to do. And you right. know. You know but you have to kind of like, it's just like, it's just a fear of dealing with all that stuff, right? And, lot, and at some point, and all these people who want to say they want to be entrepreneurs and all this stuff, I'm like, okay. Yeah. Well, used to uh, people talking crazy or just saying whatever, just all kinds of stuff, because that's, that's like what it's all about. It actually becomes what I say, and what I've said on the Instagram before is I say, most entrepreneurs just glorify telemarketers. That's what, yeah, for real, because you got to pick up the phone. I mean, I remember, you know, in my interior design business, I remember thinking, oh my God, this phone is not working. It's not ringing. I had to pick it up to see if it was working because it wasn't ringing. Mm -hmm. I had to make the phone ring. Mm -hmm. You've got to make the phone ring. Yeah. If, you're, if you're a real entrepreneur, you got to get out there. 
Yeah. You got to make the phone ring. Yep, you gotta make the phone ring. You gotta take meetings. You gotta embarrass yourself. Oh my god! You gotta embarrass yourself. Pick yourself back up. You know what? You know before this meeting, what was going on? I was I was on the phone. I was on the phone. I was texting you while I was on the phone. I had somebody who I work with helping me out speaking so that I could prepare for this. So I was literally setting up my lights and stuff. <laughs> while we're, I was sitting on the computer and everything, texted you, got the Zoom link while I was on the phone. I got right. off, you even realize this is so seamless and I'm so used to doing it. I got off the phone literally about 60 seconds before I got on here. And I, I've been there. <laughs> Trust me, been there, done that. It's all, it's all normal. It is. <laughs> Don't even worry it's, about it. Nobody has to know. It's what you do. And when you know how to do something, you do it every day. Mm -hmm. It comes easy to you because you know how to do it. And when I was on the phones, like I said, dialing for dollars, I would get there, eight on the nose. I would do a role call. I would do a role playing with someone. Eight fifteen, I was on the phone calling people. Boom, boom, boom. A hundred calls an hour. Right. You know, and I might hit fifteen people. I mm -hmm. might, after three hours of calling, I might make fifteen actual contacts. Yeah. It was like being in a tunnel. Yeah. And I would come out and be like shaking <laughs> and, and thinking, oh my God. So I made my goal. I made 15 solid contacts. Mm -hmm. And out of the 15 solid contacts, I might get five leads. Right. But I, I went from going on no appointments to going on four and five appointments a week, mm -hmm. nailing two and three appointments. I went from three listings to 25 listings. And it's all a numbers game. Mm -hmm. I went from having 25 listings to selling 21 of them. I was happy with selling 21 of them. Yeah. So, you know, you, you, have, to, you have to know your numbers. You have to track your business. You mm -hmm. have to understand your business. So for any agent out there listening, if you don't know your numbers and you don't know the language of real estate and you're in this business, you're not going to win. You're going to have to learn how to track your business. How do you know where your business came from? If you don't know where it came from last year, how do you know where you're going? <laughs> you know, you got to track it. How do you know where you're going? What's your goal? What's your numbers? You know, and I, that, like I said, my job right now as a real estate agent, as a black real estate agent in the luxury market is to see that an army of us go out there. And if we can go out there and we are knowledgeable in our markets and we know how to service that clientele, that demographic, without any fear, we'll be fire. Mm. And there's so many that are hungry that need to be at this level. Because this is life-changing money. You know? And then there's part two. What do you do with that money once you get it? To keep it. The and I said that earlier. Real mm -hmm. estate, equity, leverage. Mm -hmm. Boom. Wealth. Right. And, and what so you do in between that, that's none of my business. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is funny because it always comes down to being simplified. Success does. Um, That's right. It always gets simplified. It's like, oh, you just do this, this, this. Now the process could be, it could be challenging, and in, in, especially in the beginning, really. Oh, absolutely. It's challenging. Um, but the process itself is actually kind of systematic. Very um, much so. Business is like a, it's a combination of art and science. Um, I think that's why a lot of artists excel because essentially the scientists, uh, as long as you know enough, the scientists on the other side, the, 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 the bean counters and, and so on and so forth, right. they, they're going to help you in that process. Absolutely. So it's like you, you really, your job is, as an entrepreneur almost, is to understand a lot of the art part. I think that's why a lot of artists excel, because a lot of it has to come down with creativity and, and, and emotional intelligence. So creativity and emotional. Here's that word again. <laughs> creativity and emotional intelligence. So it's more like an artist. Exactly. So you need 
Well, a lot of us need like technical systems or help or process to learn how to, like how you were saying, you need to know your business and know, track what's happening and stuff. A lot of us do need help with that because a lot of us are creatives, essentially. Absolutely. So help on the left brain side where it's like, okay, this number is this, this, this number equals this, and this needs to happen as a result. That's the other part, interpreting the numbers. Um, that's where stuff like... Uh, you know, business school comes in handy um, or, a, or a process like the one that you're introducing to where you're going to be teaching people how to interpret uh, their business and then make that into the proper show, the proper showing. The proper showing is the part that comes in so naturally to us as entrepreneurs and artists. It's like natural, the showing right. part. It's like, because then once, you, once you're in your flow, that's easy. Yeah. You know, and you have to know your market. Mm -hmm. If you don't know your market, how can you sell? If right. you don't know the stats of the market every day, what sold, what list, what da 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 da, you don't know that. How can you sell to anybody? Because they're gonna listen. These people are smart today. They they have this just like everybody else, and they are on it, in it, and they understand, especially the savvy buyer. Mm -hmm. And that buyer becomes a seller at some point, and they know the market. They're doing their research before you even step across their threshold. And if you don't know your stuff, the next person behind you will get that job. Because every day you go out there, you're auditioning for the next job. You know, so you have to know your business. And if you don't know your business, I mean, I know people, they can rattle off things like crazy. Sometimes I get dizzy talking to them. They know so much. Would you agree to, I want to ask you, I know, you, I know we probably got to go, but I wanted to ask you one thing, how you feel about this, because this is something I noticed in sales. Would you say that when you're selling, for, when you're selling the real game changer is when you know a lot? You just know a lot. So when you're speaking, people can like hear that you know a lot. Right. That alone really actually closes the sale. It is right. not, I think it only comes from experience and seeing things and seeing stuff over and over and over again and so on and so forth and a certain knowledge and, and smarts you pick up over time that it's almost like your knowledge is closing the sale. Right. And you, sometimes you just, you, you can't oversell yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, that could be, you know, a game changer too. You don't want to oversell. The sale, the sale I notice a lot of times is, is in the lesson. That's right. It's, it's, you, it's you teaching. You're, you're right. a professor. You, hit it on the nose. you get on the phone, you're a professor. And if you're not a professor, they're not going to buy nothing. That's right. It's almost like you have to be a professor of whatever you're talking about. You need to teach them something new. If, you, if they can learn something new from you, then they'll be like, huh. Oh, okay. And you got to bring about those foundational skills mm -hmm. because they always work. Yeah. If you got the foundation, you just keep building on that. It's like a house. Mm -hmm. And that's with the conversation also. You start right. at the foundation and you keep building. And that's how you peel back the layers. Right. And next thing you know, you, I got them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm closing this deal. Whether I'm selling it or I'm purchasing it for. Right. So. And I go beyond what I'm usually, what I normally do for my customers. because you know, they're paying the big bucks. Mm -hmm. It's customer service. And that's another thing. No matter what we do in this business, it's customer service. You have to give them, and it's not service you do this. It's, it's an experience. You know, today they're buying, they're buying an experience. And you're a part of that. And that's what you have to sell. Right. Right. So, man... This, this was great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, I'm excited. Um, so w w the things that are coming one more time, because I know people are going to want to learn this, this stuff. Oh, absolutely. I'm hoping they do because so, um, well, I get excited. <laughs> you try to help people, man, but a lot of times they don't want to listen to nobody. I was just talking about this. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. You, it can be exhausting, but, huh. you know, you get those, you get that, one, two, three, four people out of that 10 and they're excited to learn. You keep, that keeps you going. Yeah, it does. 
It does. I'm excited about my book. I'm excited about my book. That should be out. And thank God that's, that should be out. And uh, my publisher said it should be out, I would say, July, August. Okay. How to land your first million dollar listing and become, oh. you know, a top agent in your market. Doesn't get any better than that. I remember someone told me, if I give you the manual, I give you the complete roadmap, will you be able to follow it? I said, yes, sir. And that's what I got. So I figured I can make my own roadmap. Yeah. And then so it's the book. And then you yep. also have the course that's coming, correct? I have a membership coming out and that'll be a luxury membership for agents to join and they will learn everything they need to know about luxury. Now, do they already need to be an agent? Oh, absolutely. Okay. So you already need to be an agent for that one. The book would be anybody who's starting out just from anybody who's starting out in real estate and then but the but the 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 higher the higher level product is for people who are already in the in are already in it and want to grow into the luxury market wants to want to really understand what it means to be in to be a luxury agent and not telling them about launching a property you know giving parties and doing videos no this is the real guts listening to experts talk about what luxury means when they're out there interior designers craftsmen tile people experts coming on having a conversation they can ask questions bring their notebooks because it's it's a it's going to be a ride and it's i think it's going to be something that um they all need to listen to because just breaking into the luxury market you don't break in you grow into that and if you're a young agent you will want to be there and it will be different every time so I want to keep them interested. Right. So when that luxury lab opens up, I want them to be there with their white coats on learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that, I know that there are, I notice uh, on my platform, I notice um, agents on there. So definitely, uh, I'm sure they definitely want to hear that and definitely want to um, take part in that. A lot of them, you know, of course on Instagram, everybody's oh they are they've already got it already but i know that they don't not everybody no they don't <laughs> they don't you know i mean it's 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 something different it's something that's it's necessary um i think they're going to learn a lot um the ones that will show up and that are interested and want to know what it means to be a luxury agent mm -hmm. you know and it's not just about you know walking the walk and looking the part it's not about that. It's about negotiating. It's about um, emotional intelligence. You know, it's about understanding, you know, the demographics that you're going to be working with. It's about understanding interior design itself, understanding what you're looking at when you walk into a home. It's about your style and knowing that style and fashion don't live on the same street. You know, mm -hmm. you have to create your own style and come into that. It's a, it has a lot of elements and you need them all. So if you show up, I'm going to give it to you. Mm -hmm. And it's about being in real estate. And also you'll learn financial literacy in there. Also, we'll have people in there talking about financial literacy. We'll have people in there talking about investing after the fact, once you make the money. Right. So we're going to have a little bit of everything for you. That's going to be great. So show up. <laughs> I forgot. Dang it! I forgot one question I wanted to ask you. I wanted to end with. I wanted to end on that note, but I can't because I have to ask one more question. But don't have them. I want them to tune in to my podcast, which oh, yes, is the podcast too. To excellence. What na the name? One more time. The podcast is from execution to excellence. Okay. I will also when I post, I will um, try to put that in my uh, description as well. Um, I don't know. Maybe I should have you on there and, and dig down and <laughs> dig a little deep with you, David. I got a story. I got okay. a story. Um, I really do uh, have a, a very interesting, crazy story. Sometimes I feel like um, maybe one of these days I'll have my life um, optioned off as a movie. Um, hey. if, I, if I do, I wonder. Uh, Anyway, I'll, I'm going to stop it right there. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to tell too much. I'm always, I'm always a little bit concerned if that happens because I don't want to hurt anyone. Right. 
you know. Um, so that's some that, that's something I actually do think about sometimes. Um, I wanted to ask you a fun question before I let you go. Um, the Rolls Royce. <laughs> Don't bring that up. <laughs> I can't bring that up. Should I stop with that? <laughs> okay. I, w- I wanted to know when you got it and how <laughs> and how and how you felt after you got it because Rolls Royce is actually my I, I actually uh, DM'd you about this. Rolls Royce is my favorite car. Um, really, uh, my favorite regular car. Lamborghini is my favorite sports car. Um, but what is what, what, how, how did that come about? How did, when did you get that and how did it make you feel when you, when you, when you started stepping out of the rolls? How was that? I was embarrassed at first. Really? <laughs> yeah, I was a little embarrassed at first. I remember calling my mom saying, Mom, you'll never guess. I'm driving, I'm rolling down the street in this black roll. <laughs> I said, it is so hot, it feels beautiful. And, um, I, I and I am. My husband used to say, "You need to pull up at your listings with that." I was like, "No, no, I'm not doing that." <laughs> I said, "I'm too embarrassed," you know. And I understood, but um, after a while, it just felt like I was driving a just beautiful car, right? You know. And then, you know, when my husband would drive it, I just felt like I was a passenger in a beautiful car. It didn't. It wasn't the excitement I had when I first got it because you know it's like you get something and you're like excited you keep looking at it out in the garage and you're like whoa that's really heavy you know Mm -hmm. and um yeah yeah i was excited and then it kind of wore off it became normal (laughs) it became normal and then you know you have a few of them you 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 have one and you change it to another color or something and it's just like it's kind of normal it becomes normal in your life and it's just something you have. It's just a, a nice car that you have, you know. Right. You know, that I don't drive that to work. <laughs> no, so you don't take it on any listings or anything like that. Edit this. <laughs> I used it in my, when I had the $20 million listing, I used it in my marketing because it warrant that. I mean, That's and then I, I had a seven and I had a $10 million listing and I would sit it outside. It warrant that, you know. Right. And, and I, I'll never forget my client. This is a funny story. I said to my client, I'm going to make this video. And um, I, I need, uh, well, actually, I wasn't talking to her. I was talking to her liaison. And the funny thing is I never met her until I had the launch party for the property itself. She walked up to me. I didn't even know who she was. Mm. That was the, the real strange thing because I could have said anything. And she walked up to me and said, I think you're somebody I should know. I I think you're somebody I'm told I should know. And I was like, yeah, hi, how are you? And she was like, hi. And I was like, so are you enjoying the party? And she was like, yes. And she was like, I'm the owner. I was blown away. I just grabbed her and hugged her really tight. (laughs) <laughs> I was like, thank you so much. I said, you have no idea. I said, I am going to sell this property. Because the thing about having a property at that level is it's one thing to get it. It's another thing to sell it. Right. So not only did I get it, I sold it. And not only did I sell it, I had no idea the publicity that was going to come behind it. I had no idea that it was just going to blow up like it did. And the funny thing is I went home and I opened a can of soup and I went to bed because the transaction was so taxing. It wasn't a fun transaction. It wasn't a smooth transaction. And it wasn't because of us. It was because the other side. But I, in the end, I won. And that's all that mattered. Mm-hmm. But um, that was very interesting. And when I said to her, I was going to do this, when I said to the liaison, I was going to do the video, she called whomever it was at that time, which I did not know them, and said, um, I said, you know, I'm going to need a couple cars. I probably could borrow one from the dealership. And she says, oh, no, we have a drop top Rolls Royce. I said, that's great. So when I showed the video to them and sent it over to the finished product, she said, oh, whose Rolls Royce is that? 
I said, oh, that's, that's my Rolls Royce, the black one, the hard top. So I had two Rolls Royces. I had hers and I had mine and she was shocked. <laughs> they wrote back to me and said, oh, okay. So that's the only time I ever used it in, for work or in one of the videos. That was the only time mm -hmm. I used it. And the video you saw was not the video I created for the property. I created that to show the lifestyle of the area and to talk about the property itself because, you know, and I had to narrate it, you know, I did, that was one take, mm -hmm. one very nervous take, but I had shown the place so many times I knew the script and the cameraman was in front of me and I was just walking towards, he was, I was walking towards him and he was walking backwards and just taking it. And I remember saying to him, I want to redo it. And he was like, no way. He said, if you nailed it. If you do it again, you're going to screw it up. And that's how that happened. <laughs> and it was very interesting because I'll never forget when he sent it to me, I said, I don't like it. And he was like, are you crazy? Do you even know what you're looking at? <laughs> so that, that was really good. Yeah, but about the Rolls Royce, yeah, that was the um, only time I've had, I have ever taken it to a listing. And um, the only time I ever used it, and I showed up for the other side because I just wanted to show them who they were dealing with. Mm -hmm. And that was, that's why I said when I came home, I just kind of had soup and went to bed. It didn't, I didn't even register with me what I did until the press, it hit the press because it was the largest um, penthouse ever sold in Naples on the mm -hmm. beach. And I did it. So I got, that when that press came, when that wave came, I mean, uh, what was it? Uh, Mansion Global called me. Naples Daily News Curb called me. Miami Best. I mean, everybody was calling me. Everybody wanted to interview. You know, Black Enterprise called me. Mm. Next thing I know, I was I was somebody. <laughs> so you know that that was the highlight of my career at that point. And then it's just been you know rolling on since then. And um, yeah, that, that was a beautiful thing. That all the work paid off. Right. And it was hard work. It was not easy. You know, um, it took me a year to sell that property. So I had to keep that type of property on the market for a year. So you can imagine the marketing dollars and what was expected. And that was a whole nother level for me because I had never dealt with clients who were steering the, you know, the ship, they was pretty much driving the car. I had to account for everything. I had to tell them who I was going to use for, for photography, who I was going to have at the party, who was coming through the door. I mean, and I always had command of the ship. That was a whole nother level. And that taught me something different. And then I realized, okay, this is a whole different ball game, Jane. So, you know, every time you reach another height, the game changes a little bit mm -hmm. and you have to be prepared. So all that experience that came behind me came to that one place. It all merged on that one listing at that time. And I had to call in everybody. I had to call people that I knew could purchase that property. They didn't want anybody else there. So that when I say you can get lucky, but you must have the resources. Yeah. You know, you must know who to call. You must know that you got to call wealth managers. You know, who's your sponsor? Mm -hmm. Who's your media partner? These are things you, you need to have in place when you get to that level. Or guess what? It's not going to happen. Where do you advertise? Can you afford to advertise? So you need a little bit more than luck. You need resources. And that's where this membership comes into place because I teach you how to garner those people. And if you don't know, ain't nobody going to tell you. Yeah. This is just the way it is. Yeah. Does somebody else want that money? Right. They're going to keep it for themselves. You know, you, you, you selling 20, 30, $40 million listing. You're looking at a million dollar paycheck. <laughs> you know, that's a life changing money. And I try to tell agents, people say, oh, well, you know, I'm doing this part-time. This is not a part-time job. This is a full-time job. This is a career. And you have to take it on with that type of attitude because 
this career or this part-time job, you call it, can change your whole trajectory in life. And that's what it does. And you can't make this kind of money at no job. We have no ceiling. We blew the ceiling off. <laughs> we blew this off the roof a long time ago. You know, and that's the attitude you have to have. And keep your foundation straight. Right. You, know, you, you sideways, you in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> right. You go sideways, you in trouble. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, that's my story and I'm sticking to it, David. <laughs> I, love it. I love it. That was a perfect way to end it. Um, dang, thank you for coming on. Oh, thank oh. you for having me. It's been fun. I, you know, I, it's a nice connection. Yeah. And, and I love when they happen organically like this. Right. Yeah. Because I had no, I had no idea, you know, just. Right. You know, um, so yeah, me too. And I'm real glad.